Especially the world is full of disagreement and problems and unresolved conflict. We need to be reminded of God's power and might. In many places, the Bible reminds us of these kinds of things about God, such as Psalm 93. The Lord is king. He is robed in majesty. Indeed, the Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. The world stands firm and cannot be shaken. Your throne, O Lord, has stood for all time. Yourself are the everlasting past. The floods have risen up, O Lord. The floods have roared like thunder. The floods have lifted their pounding waves. But mightier than the violent raging of the seas, mightier than the on the shore, the Lord above is mightier than these. Your royal laws cannot be changed. Your reign, O Lord, is holy forever and ever. Israel Bellin was born in the late 1800s in a poor town into a poor family in a persecuted Jewish community in Siberia, Russia. It was a tough, tough upbringing for he and his eight siblings in this small community. His father was a Jewish cantor, so he led the Jewish community in his local place in their worship and in their habits of trying to follow God. At the age of five, Israel and his family followed the throngs of people that were immigrating away from Russia toward the United States for a better life. He and his family hopped on board a ship, and they made their way through Ellis Island. They came through Ellis Island, and they settled quickly in a Jewish quarter of New York City in Manhattan. Israel and his siblings attended school, at least some of them did. The others worked. And pretty quickly, Israel had to work too. All of his siblings and him quit school because they could not find enough work to sustain and support their family. Israel took a couple odd jobs, trying to earn just pennies that they put together to be able to eat and to pay their rent in their apartment. Pretty quickly, he found a job as a song plugger somebody who repeated popular songs and sang them and made up other lyrics for them just to have fun. And he started delighting the people that he sang the songs for. Soon after, he got a job at a cafe, and he did the same sort of thing as a waiter. And he would go around and he would sing songs and make up other lyrics to them and make them even more fun so people knew the familiar tunes but then he added the different lyrics, and it made it so much more fun for everybody who heard them. After the restaurant closed most of the nights, he would go to the back, and he would sit down at the piano, which he did not know how to play, and he taught himself to play piano. For some unknown reason, he only played in the key of F sharp. Nobody knows why. He started writing music, writing his own little songs, his own little melodies, making up words to others. And the staff pianist at the restaurant heard his music and saw the potential. So he got one of his songs published. And when he got it published, he had to write down all the information and he miswrote Israel's name. Instead of Israel Bellin, he wrote Irving Berlin. And his music just went viral. I mean, he, he established some of what we know as Broadway. He established the show tune. He wrote full-length musicals. I mean, he wrote so many iconic songs that we all know and sing all the time. When World War I came, Irving Berlin was drafted. He was not drafted as a soldier. He was drafted as a songwriter because the military realized we don't just need soldiers, we need some morale boost, and what better way to do that than to bring in one of the most popular songwriters and boost the morale of our troops in the fields. So he did, 
He wrote all kinds of songs, he held all kinds of events, and he lifted the spirits of the troops during World War I. He was asked to write a bunch of music at the close of World War I, which, which he did, and he wrote tons of music for this festival and this show. One of the songs he decided, I'm just going to put this away because it's just not the right song. Twenty years later, he dusted it off and brought it out for a celebration of Armistice Day. Twenty years after the celebration of the end of World War I, they were celebrating Armistice Day, and they asked him for music. And he said, I've got the song. And so he dusted it off, and that's when he brought out God Bless America, Land That I Love, Stand Beside Her and Guide Her. He brought that song out, and we've been singing it ever since. How did somebody so easily take their allegiance to America and their faith in God and blend it together? in a way that everybody loved. Because we know it's not that easy to take our citizenship and our allegiance to the land we live in and our faith in the Jesus who we strive to follow and put them together in a real smooth, easy, balanced, blended way. It just doesn't work that easily most of the time. The conversations don't go all that easily. The agreements don't always happen. And it's not always easy to connect the two together. How does our faith in Jesus connect with our allegiance to our country? Does Jesus have much of anything to do with our living in America? What does Jesus and what does our faith in him have to do with our responses to politics, our reactions to politics, or even our attitudes about them at all? What does the Bible have to say about our faith and our politics? It has a lot to say. The Bible has a lot to say about politics. The document is full of places where it talks about government, where it talks about leaders, where it talks about laws, where it talks about organization and people groups and what they should do and punishments and rewards and freedoms. It has a lot to do with faith. Because faith, after all, can move mountains. Faith is something we're responsible for growing and developing or something that connects on some of the deepest relationships that we could ever have with our God and with Jesus. The Bible also talks a lot about faith and politics together. I mean, Moses, a priest who brings faith into a highly political world. Jesus, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, give to God what is God's, brings faith and politics crashing together. So many places. When America was founded, we were founded on this principle of the separation between church and state. It's a good principle. It's healthy, and it was needed. Because we came from places where there was no separation, and the state was demanding what we believe. The state was mandating what people believe. And our Constitution, our leaders, realized that is not healthy for a free society. So we need to separate church and state. So the state can no longer define what we believe. The, the state doesn't tell us what we must believe. But it's easy for us to take that separation between church and state and say, oh, that means that my politics are completely separate from my faith. That I, when I think about my governor and my senator, I don't think about Jesus at the same time. The two just, they don't go. We've got this concept that they have to be separate. When in real life, we know they're not. If we really believe in Jesus, if we really strive to follow God, that's just pervasive into everything that we do and everything we think and the ways that we respond and react and the actions that we take in the political world, too. So how does our faith relate to our politics? In what ways can our faith shape our political decisions and attitudes and actions? Um, let's talk about government for a minute. That should be fun. In the, in the days of the Old Testament, the leaders of the world, the leaders of Israel, were not named chancellor or prime minister or president or, uh, or top reigning official. And their governments were not monarchies 
and oligarchies and republics and democracies and aristocracies. They, they were not these because the leader of the people in the nation of Israel for the people of God was God. It, God was literally their king. Ever since God brought the people out of Egypt, which we've been really diving into for a while, whenever, as soon as God led them out, the nation of Israel was established as a people, and God was established as their king. So God was their leader, if there was ever a leader. We would call their system of government a theocracy, because their God, their theos, their God was their leader, and so their system was a theocracy. They obeyed and followed their leader, who was God. But in order for that to work, God had to do certain things in placing leaders in charge of the people. And so God did that. Ever since the days of Moses, God placed Moses in charge of the people. Then God placed Joshua in charge of the people, bringing them into the promised land. Then after that, there were judges who ruled over the people, uh, names like Gideon and Samson and Deborah and Samuel. Now, now Samuel is an interesting guy. Samuel was both a prophet and a judge, and if there was ever somebody who God would, would put a medal around their neck as being a good, faithful leader, as far as we can tell, that's Samuel. He would have gotten the medal around his neck. This, the guy was faithful, the guy led the people, the guy traveled around the country and helped people stick to their faith. He visited the people and knew the people. Uh, he even brought that choice, joyous piece, that centerpiece of their faith, the Ark of the Covenant. He brought it back to the people after it was stolen from them by the Philistines. No small act. I mean, this is Samuel, their leader. As Samuel was getting old in age, they had to figure out who would be the next leader. Samuel had two sons, and oh, Samuel's sons. They were not like Samuel. Uh, the Bible actually describes them as not like their father. I mean, literally, they were not like their father. They made some really poor choices. But Samuel appointed them to the role of judges over Israel. Unfortunately, they did not rise to the occasion of being judges of Israel. They perverted justice. They were very greedy. They were very self-serving, and they took bribes from people. First Samuel describes what they did, and it was not good. So what do you do when a situation like this happens? Do you hold an election? Do you call the political parties to bring a top-running candidate to the floor? Uh, do you have a revolt? I mean, what do you do to, to replace the leader? Do you impeach them? Where do you go and what do you do? Let's find out. Let's read from 1 Samuel chapter 8 and see what happens. Finally, all the elders of, elders of Israel met at Ramah to discuss the matter with Samuel. Look, they told him, you are now old and your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. Samuel was displeased with their request and went to the Lord for guidance. Do everything they say to you, the Lord replied, for they are rejecting me, not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer. Ever since I brought them from Egypt, they have continually abandoned me and followed other gods. And now they are giving you the same treatment. Do as they ask but solemnly warn them about the way a king will reign over them. So Samuel passed on the Lord's warning to the people who were asking him for a king. But the people refused to listen to Samuel's warning. Even so, we still want a king, they said. We want to be like the nations around us. Our king will judge us and lead us into battle. How did that go? Not so well. I mean, on the one hand, they shouldn't have even asked. But on the other hand, now they've got to figure out what to do because they did ask. And realize these are people who all hold faith in God. Samuel, clearly, we know he's, he's, the, he's kind of the award winner. He's the guy who has demonstrated his faith. And he's trying to use that faith to instruct and to guide the system that he's in. 
how does God want this to go? The elders, and we don't know if, if, if they're a group of priests, if they're a group of commissioned or appointed leaders for the people, whatever they are, they are people of faith. They are people in the nation of Israel who were brought up and who know God, who in a, are in a people group that are trying to follow God. So in some way or another, they're trying to exercise their faith, although it's different than the way Samuel was. They're trying to bring their faith into interaction with their political world and figure out what to do with it. How does our faith shape our politics? This story, and of course there's much more to the story, it's a fun one to read. Feel free to read the rest of it. We're just going to look at this portion of it. At least this portion has four lessons for us about how our faith can shape our politics, and along with it, four questions that I think we could ask ourselves, we could ask each other, about how our faith can shape our politics. So, uh, first uh, reality, first idea, be careful what fills our minds. The elders had to figure out what to do, and in order to figure out what to do, they filled their minds with something. If we go back to the story, we can see what actually filled their minds. They looked out at the other nations. They looked at the Edomites and the Amorites and the Amalekites and all the other ites that are around them. And they looked at all these people and they saw what they had. And they're like, ooh, those people, they've got a king. And that king, oh, that king is doing some great things. Oh, look at that nation. They're really doing well. They're prospering. They're strong, they're victorious, they're taking over more land. We want to be like them. So they looked at all these nations and they said, why can't we be like that? So they looked to the other nations for their wisdom. We have all kinds of resources and all kinds of things available to us. We have wisdom in all sorts of places that we could find. And we could probably spend all of our time listening, reading, and watching all kinds of wisdom. It's available all the time about who to follow, who's the best leader, who has the best promises, who to vote for. We could fill our minds. And many of, much of that information is very good. It's very helpful. It's necessary. But what do we fill our minds with? We could fill it with all kinds of things, and the elders at least fill their minds with one thing, and Samuel encourages filling their minds with other things, but what do we fill our minds with? Do we, do we fill our minds with the best things? Several favorite verses uh, from Colossians and Romans. Set your minds on the things above, not the things of earth. Not exclusively. He's not saying don't ever think about the stuff around you, but what are we going to fill our minds with? And do not conform to the pattern of this world. That has to do with what we set our minds on. Uh, if somebody said to you, I want you to notice white trucks. For the rest of the day when you drive around, you're going to notice white trucks. And we're going to start to think, did everybody just go out and buy a white truck? Because we're going to start seeing them everywhere if we keep talking about white trucks. But everybody did not go out and buy a white truck. We're just noticing them because our minds are thinking about white trucks. Now you're going to see white trucks all day. But we've, whatever we dwell on, whatever we think on, that's what fills our minds. And that's what shapes our actions and our attitudes and the things that we think about and do. Likewise, whatever we fill our minds with in terms of the political season we're in, that will shape the things we talk about the things we do, and the things we even start to trust and believe. So, the question for us, is this the best way to fill my mind? Whatever we're doing, whatever we're filling our mind, is this the best way to fill my mind? Sometimes, it might be. Other times, it might not be. But is this the best way to fill my mind? Perhaps it's a question worth asking frequently. Um, second, Second thing, beware of number one. The people knew that their number one was God their king. 
But in the days of Samuel, they didn't necessarily know all of this about who was number one because they had some competing ideas about who was number one. The elders had their idea about who should be number one. We want a king from over there. And Samuel had a different idea about who was number one. He kept going to God, who was their king, to find out. When we talk about who's number one, you know, taking care of number one, we know that that's talking about ourselves. Like, I need to take care of number one. That's the most important. And we all have a spot in our lives that has number one relationships and number one uh, consultants and number one mentors and number one valuable pieces and places in our lives. Who holds that number one spot? God has a lot to say about that. You shall have no other gods before me. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. God has lots of ideas about who and what should be number one in our lives. Who is that number one? Uh, Jesus plainly said in, chapter, in John, trust in God, trust also in me, he says. But simple and plain, trust, all, trust in God, trust also in me. That was a number one statement. Who is the number one in our lives? And so the question that we might ask, who is my number one today? Because when we make the decision of who's my number one, it may be a challenge the next day, but perhaps a daily question of who is my number one today. Um, third thing, connecting faith and politics together. Be wise about where we get wisdom. In the story of Samuel and the elders, the elders are searching for a solution to their problem. And so they go looking for wisdom. And where do they go for their wisdom? They go to the other nations. They go to all these different places to find their wisdom. Similar to what fills our minds, they're looking for wisdom. They're looking for a solution and some examples of well, what works. Where can I go to find a solution? Because their situation wasn't working. Samuel's boys were not panning out to be good leaders. They needed wisdom somewhere else, so they went and got it. When they go ask Samuel, Samuel, we want a king, Samuel was bothered by that. And Samuel thought, I, I need to consult with God. So where does Samuel go to find his wisdom? He, he goes to God, and then he goes to God again. I mean, time and time, Samuel goes back to God because Samuel's source of his wisdom seems to be Asking God for wisdom. The book of James plainly says, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Be sure that your number one is in God alone. If we need wisdom, when we need wisdom, when we lack wisdom, when we're trying to find the right way to wisdom, ask God. We have all kinds of resources for our voting, for our political ideas, for the ways that we should go forward as a nation, for the issues that we're struggling with and dealing with. We have lots of wisdom and places that we can go for that. Why not add in praying that God would guide us in responding to the right leaders, having great attitudes, having a good reaction to something, being able to vote in the right way and be informed about it. I mean, voting is tough. Voting is, is a big responsibility, but a great privilege. Why not pray that God would guide us to be able to vote wisely and to be able to fill with, be filled with wisdom? So, question. Am I seeking the best sources for wisdom? Oh, there's a lot of sources for our wisdom, and we know some are better than others. Am I seeking the best sources for wisdom? Fourth and final, be certain that God reigns no matter what. The part of the story that caught me off guard was God's reaction. You know, Samuel brings this whole problem to God, and I expected God to say something like, Samuel, you tell those elders, those people who think they know what they're doing, but they really don't know what they're doing, to take their idea of a king or take their idea of a leader and just take it back to where they found it. Maybe that's what I would have said to them. I don't know, but that's not what God said. What did God say? Give them everything they ask for. Let them have it. 
Why did God, why did God, I, did they just pull the wool over God's eyes? Was God in a moment of weakness? I mean, surely not. God had warned them for centuries, for generations, that this was not the right way. That as they were rebelling, God said, no, this is the way. I should be your king. And finally, God just let them have it. And it's not that God just says, sure, go ahead, and I'm just going to wait until I can say I told you so. No, I mean, God is all in, isn't he? I mean, God's the one who appoints their first king. God's the one who anoints their first king via Samuel. God's the one who replaces Saul's heart with a new one so that Saul's heart would be adequate for the job that he has to do as Israel's king. And then God sustains this whole sequence of kings for a couple hundred years in Israel, and then another 150 years in Judah. Hundreds of years, God says, hey, this is going to work. Some of the kings were good. Most of the kings were not good. But God is still endorsing this kinghood. God's not taking it away. God's letting them have their king, even though it doesn't work. So many times in the Psalms, it talks about God reigning. And as it does talk about God reigning, it often talks about God reigning forever. The Lord will reign forever. He will be your God throughout the generations. There's other places to talk about the same thing. God doesn't just reign God reigns forever. So whatever leader might be in place, whether we like him or not, whatever leader or leaders get voted in November 5th, whether we like him or not, whatever president or governor or senator or Supreme Court or whoever it is who happens to be there, whether we like him or not, whatever ballot measure, whatever anything gets voted in, it's not that it doesn't matter, but it does matter that God reigns forever. And God's going to outlast them. And God is going to have God's plans established no matter what. Because at the end of the day, God will reign no matter what. No matter the leader, no matter the circumstance, no matter the peaceful or war-torn situation, God will reign forever. One way we've encouraged before, which I know we, many of us have used, if not all of us have used, um, to help us be connected between our faith and our politics is these, these bookmarks that have leaders written on them that we can pray for. Um, we have a stack of them on the table. They're the current leaders in place in all sorts of different levels of our government system. Um, you're welcome to take one. Uh, they may change in another uh, 25 or 30 days, but at least for the next 30 days, we can pray for the leaders that are in place. Uh, and why not pray? that God's power would move, that our minds would be filled with this kind of wisdom, that we would know the right steps to take, and that we would be able to be faithful followers of Jesus and live and work in America. Would you pray with me?